and welcome to Trials to Triumphs. I'm Ashley Blaine Featherson Jenkins, but you can call me ABFJ. This week, I'm talking to rising star Lady London, whom you may have seen flowing and freestyling all over social media. Today, Lady London and I are talking about preparation and the importance of studying your craft. I'm rarely nervous. It's not one of my go-to emotions. Excitement, embarrassment. Yes, I tend to get embarrassed by things that I shouldn't be embarrassed by. More on this another day. (laughs) Joy, optimism, those are more common for me. Being nervous just throws me off balance and I don't feel my best. When I look back at the key times in my life when I've been nervous, it was usually due to feeling unprepared. I know what you're thinking. Ashley, unprepared? The girl with a daily to-do list? (laughs) Hear me out. If I feel slightly discouraged, I procrastinate, which ultimately makes me feel unprepared and then nervous. But I've learned that for me, it's all self-inflicted. It's a choice. So if life is all about choices, then I choose to be confident which then encourages me to not procrastinate so that I then feel prepared. And I can see how this method has catapulted London to success. Lady London has a master's of science in global medicine with a concentration in international health policy. A mouthful, right? She's a beast. Then despite her initial resistance, she studied her craft and confidently pivoted to rapping. As much as I kept trying to go, I'm not a rapper. I'm not, I would say every day, I'm not a rapper. I'm in school, I'm not a rapper. It would be like, are you not? Are you? Like, Mm. because all of these opportunities (laughs) have arisen for you here and not here. I was getting denied jobs. I was overqualified for bachelor level positions and and underqualified for PhD level positions because I had a master's. Mm. So I was in, in that weird zone applying for jobs. But rap music was like, here's a deal. Here's a label deal. Here's 10 label deals. Wow. You know what I mean? And in our Sankofa moment, who Lady London would have loved to headline a tour with in the late 90s? I think that would have been incredible and an in- entire sh- culture shock for the community. Hi, sis. Hey, Thank you for well. joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Welcome. Love the sweatshirt. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Okay. So I'm wearing my Howard University class of 2009 homecoming sweater. <laughs> I'm definitely uh, aging myself. But I, yes, I'm wearing it because I'm sitting here and talking to an amazing Howard alum, mm-hmm. Lady London. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So talk to me about the beginning. Talk to me about New York and New Jersey. Mm-hmm. What did East Orange, what did the Bronx teach you? What did it give you? Hustle, hustle, grind. A lot of it is a lot of stagnation there oftentimes. So being able to leave and branch out and become whoever you set out to be is is really, it's really a beautiful thing because not a lot of people are given the opportunity to to do so, you know, especially in those neighborhoods. But I'm so proud of of being where I'm from and me going to Howard, and I say it all the time, I it changed my life. And I learned so much about myself being in that space that I'm not sure I ever would have got if I would not have journeyed out, you know? You were not in the College of Fine Arts while you were at Howard. No fine, fine, fine for me. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing chemistry. You yeah. were doing med stuff. I got to yeah. know how we... One, how you got there, but Mm -hmm. how we transitioned into you creating the art that you're creating now. I know. It's been been quite a journey. So beginning with, I started in poetry when I was 11. Just poetry. Mm. You know, I've always felt it as an escape to my reality, I guess you can say. I've always written at a very proficient level. But I I always wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon for an NFL team. And um, wow. That was just kind of like my passion. Since I always tell my mom that since I was real young that I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't know what kind of doctor back then, but I knew like I wanted to be a doctor. I used to take like science classes throughout the summer when I was a kid, when I was like in in high school going into college. My degree at Howard is in sports medicine and chemistry. And then I went on to University mm. of Southern California at the Keck School of Medicine, where I got my master's of science in global medicine with a concentration on international health policy specifically. Wow. Um, and then I started music. 
Okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. I got to <laughs> wait. We'll just actually pause before we get there. <laughs> Everybody knows mm-hmm. chemistry Girl. is so difficult. Yeah. But what this says to me, it makes sense with the type of music you create. Mm-hmm. Because the part of the reason why I think people are so attracted to you, I think, is because you are highly intelligent. And that comes through in your music. Mm-hmm. And so I'm curious about, did you feel like, for example, you, you loved poetry? Did you feel like you had to kind of set poetry down in th- that period of time when you were in college and then you went to grad school? Like, how did you, or did, were you doing both the whole time? No, I was pretty much doing both. I've always thought of it as just a hobby. You know, I've never thought of, po- of poetry as something as as a means of career mm. or as a means of, like, income. So as far as I was concerned, it was something that I did, just like anyone else would do. If someone plays tennis on the side or plays something, I didn't think that's much of it. And boy, was I wrong, because it did help a lot when my transition to music. Do you have a favorite poet, a favorite poem? I don't know that I do have like one favorite. I definitely admire some of the women in poetry. Jasmine Manns was probably one of my biggest inspirations growing up probably in the high, in my high school to college years. Of course, the Maya Angelos, the Toni Morrisons, the Fireside Poets, the Ralph Waldo Emersons and Langston Hughes. And the list goes on and on. Do you have a quote or a scripture that you live by that's really... Yeah important to you? So my favorite scripture is James chapter one, verse five through eight. It says, have faith without doubting for the doubter is like the surging of the sea. Let him not believe he will receive anything from the Lord for a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Something of that derivative, is, is, it's, it says that. But basically mm-hmm. what I gauge from that, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways is so imperative to me because it's like, I think of it often as like, you can't pray and worry. Like you can't, you, mm. they can't coexist with each other. So it's definitely a mantra that I live by 100%. Okay. <laughs> so taking that scripture, mm-hmm. if you can't pray and worry at the same time, mm-hmm. how did you make this transition from being in med school <laughs> to saying, I'm going to forge a new path for myself mm-hmm. because I truly believe that this is where I'm supposed to be headed? How did you do that and not worry? Or did you? No, I, I really stand by that scripture because I think it, it has it has so much relevance in life. So I did not worry while I was on my journey. The thing about it is life is uncomfortable for two reasons, mm-hmm. either because you're stepping out of your comfort zone or you're becoming too stagnant in the space that you already are in. So either way, you're uncomfortable. You just have to choose which <laughs> which level of uncomfort you want to sit in. And so stagnancy is the same as regression to me. And all I wanted to do was progress and continue to be better. And I think rap, for me, it was just certain things you can't run from. Like your destiny is your destiny. And as much as I kept trying to go, I'm not a rapper. I'm not, a, I would say every day, I'm not a rapper. I'm in school. I'm not a rapper. It would be like, are you not? Are you? Like, mm. because all of these opportunities <laughs> have arisen for you here and not here. I was getting denied jobs. I was overqualified for bachelor level positions and and underqualified for PhD level positions because I had a master's. Mm. So I was in in that weird zone applying for jobs. But rap music was like, here's a deal. Here's a label deal. Here's 10 label deals. You know what I mean? Wow. Whoa. It's almost like God, uh, you know, made it impossible for you to go in another path. Yeah. To me, it's sounding like I was doing one thing and then I just chose to do another thing and then it just, and I know that's not how it's gone down. (laughs) So what's that in between? I like that you clearly weren't doubting yourself and you Mm -hmm. trusted the path Mm -hmm. that you were going down and the pivot you had to make. Mm -hmm. But I want to know, what did it really feel like? while doing that? How difficult was it to still make that choice every day to not choose fear and to choose faith? So difficult. I mean, some days I really couldn't Mm. even get out of bed about it, you know? And it's hard. And Mm. also, I think the hardest part for me was dealing with social media that I hadn't had to deal with. I've always been, I guess, popular, you know, for the most part, but never to a point where I'm subject to public scrutiny or subject to whatever Mm. people have to say. And so I think that for me was the most discouraging. 
Because did I believe in my art? Sure. Did I have work to do? Absolutely. Everything takes work, more work. I still have work to do. But having to deal with people's opinions and doubts and very harsh things being said, I think that was the worst. That was the most determinant fact that I was like, will I keep doing this? Because is it worth my peace mm-hmm. of mind, my sanity, my mental health and prioritizing, learning to prioritize that is still an uphill battle. Yeah. What was that moment like when you first, you had your first social media, for lack of a better term, shut down? When you were like, I'm hurt. I'm a real person. Mm -hmm. I am hurt. I don't know who these strangers are that that feel like they can say whatever to me and whatever about me, but I'm struggling with this. Talk to me about that moment. I can't say that my first trauma response was hurt because innately Mm -hmm. I usually got angry before I got sad. Because for me, anger was a more acceptable feeling than hurt because Black women are are taught this way. This is how we are groomed. You're not allowed to show sadness. You can show confidence, boldness, things like that. But sadness denotes weakness to me. And so my first mm-hmm. perception was like, who are y'all talking to? Like, I, I'm going at it. I'm replying back. And I'm just... And what I realized throughout my career, luckily now, is that whatever you feed will grow. So if you feed the negativity, it grows bigger. If you feed positivity, it grows bigger. But if you starve it, it diminishes. And so what I learned Mm. to do was delete, block, delete, block, delete, block. And now I still, you know, take upon those methods. Every now, very seldom will you ever catch me really say something back to someone in in a combative manner. But to be honest, like, I know that people want a response. They just want a response out of you. And, And often they project themselves in their own weaknesses on you. And it's not sure. That's not your plight. That's not your business. But it, it gets overwhelming. Yeah. That, it, I, I love that you're talking about how your first trauma response is anger, or it was, mm-hmm. because I'm realizing that for me, it's hurt. It's okay. sadness. It's something I'm trying to work on. Because for me, when I do that, I then take accountability for things that are not mine. Mm-hmm. If I then get hurt, right, right. Mm-hmm. If I get hurt, if I get sad, then I start feeling like, well, why do I feel this way? Maybe it's something I could have done. Maybe if I had blah blah, I start going down this path. Where sometimes, if you again, if you get get angry about what someone is spewing at you, yeah. you don't necessarily have to react, right? Yeah. But it's important to feel it because then you realize this is not mine. Yeah. This is not mine. This is ridiculous. This is somebody else's issues and trauma. And this is not something that I need to internalize. Right. So I think that's really interesting. Would you say in any way that you feel that anger has served you? I don't think anything, any stages of this is self-serving personally outside mm. of of getting over it. So I think that we all experience the stages of grief in anything, right? So there's denial, anger, bargaining, depression, acceptance. But it's nobody, no one can tell you what order that goes in. Like sometimes you go back and forth. Like you said, your first defense mechanism is the sadness. Whereas I trigger with mm-hmm. anger, but it goes to depression. It goes to sadness. It goes to empathy where I feel like I did do something to make them say this the same way you do. I think none of it is self-serving outside of just knowing yourself and, and knowing who you are and how you are. And and that's it. Just having that identity within yourself, which is so important. So what are the ways that you feel like social media has been beautiful for you? Uh-oh. Because that's how I, like, for instance, that's how I came to you, right? Yeah, like, if yeah. we weren't, and you made me smile and mm-hmm. brought me joy. And so mm-hmm. I've been following your beautiful and amb- ambitious and wonderful career how have you felt the love on social media? Oh, the love overpowers the hate by twos. Mm-hmm. And I think that's with anything. God is love. I, I love love. You know what I mean? I think with social media has given me the chance to expose myself more than any anybody could before. Like social media is an incredible means of exposure, especially if you exhibit consistency in your craft. You know, I, I put out Lady Lundays week after week after week and I, I gained the followers. I gained the notoriety. I gained the accolades and all the acknowledgments. And I can't let the hate take away from any of it. Talk to me about Lady Lundays and why you created it, what it is. Lady Lundays was my, that's my start in this, I guess you can say. When I first started rapping, I was dating this guy. I'll give him credit for this. It's the only thing I'll ever give him credit for. Um, (laughs) (laughs) 
I was dating him. You know, we lived together. And when I first started rapping, he was like, you have to find something that's yours, like that you can like hashtag or something that can have people like follow you on a regular basis. He's like, maybe you should pick a day of the week Mm. that you drop a freestyle. And I'm like, yeah, but nothing rhymes with my name. And so he's like, okay, we can figure it out. He's like, what what about Lady Mondays? I'm like, or Lady Lundays. So we have these, Mm. like, I started to drop a freestyle every week for about maybe five months consistently or six months. Every month I was getting 20,000 followers. And now I'm up to over 800,000, you know, just three Mm. years after the whole start of everything. Take me back to that in-between moment, right? Mm -hmm. How did you start going into being a rapper full-time? What was that in-between time? What was that? How did it feel? Yeah, it was definitely a transition. And I, I really say everything happens for a reason because I don't know how I would have did it without the support of those that were around me at the time. But especially my ex at the time was very, very supportive in my career coming up. He was very financially supportive. He bought me my first mic, my first studio audio face to be in the, in the, in the house while I was recording, pay for my studio session, just small things that like really wow. made me, really made me a good artist. I didn't know how to rap when I first started. I only knew poetry. So when I put on a beat, I didn't understand timing, uh, spacing, cadence and how meters work. Like I didn't understand pockets. I didn't know none of that. I just knew lyrics. And so, you know, Mm. learning and teaching myself how to rap month after month and day after day, waking up early, just trying to learn it, studying, watching Jay-Z videos forever, watching Jadakiss videos forever, like sitting there day Mm. up, like sun up to sundown, watching them on YouTube, watching how they did things and constructed things and making my own style, making my own way out of it. It was crazy, but it worked out because I developed this thing that was mine and it was, it was just mine. No one else had it. And people related to it. Wow. So the whole time you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, I said one of the things that I think makes you very attractive is how highly intelligent you are. But Mm -hmm. taking that a step further, what I'm realizing about you is that inherently you're a scholar. Mm -hmm. And that is so cool (laughs) to me. Wow. Thank you. That means so much, really. Talk to me about why it's important to stay true to yourself, specifically in relation to the industry that you're in, Mm -hmm. the music industry? Yeah, I mean, it's not for the faint-hearted, it's not for the weak, and it's not for the unidentified. And especially where we are in LA, you have to come here knowing who you are, or you will get swept away by so many different people becoming influential to you and making you this one being of a combination of everyone else. I think you should stay true to who you are, but also be okay with evolving. I think that people get very comfortable with boxing people into spaces. Like how you met me may not be how things progress, you know? And that's even a testament to myself. When I first started, I was 23. I was literally living off of this guy. You know what I mean? Like I was behind my computer Mm -hmm. screen kind of like just doing it as a hobby when I became a brand and when I wanted to learn how to brand myself to a point where I can get brand partnerships with people that align with my what I want to do with my life. That meant a whole rebrand. That meant like really digging into what I like and what I love and, and bringing it out of myself. And I think a lot of people, some people were uncomfortable with the shift. Some people were just mm-hmm. not with it, but it's okay to evolve. Growth evolving is part of life. And just, I wouldn't let anyone tell you who you are, be who you are. You know, that's important in the industry. Yeah. You know, who it. you are is enough. Like, yeah. it's it's enough. That's I think every artist, every person has to know that who you are is enough. Yeah. You were created for such a time as this, mm-hmm. and it's up to you to simply figure out what your purpose is and why you're here. But once you figure that out then just go full steam ahead with being unapologetically you. Mm -hmm. Because then we get amazing artists Mm -hmm. like yourself, right? (laughs) Who you are nobody but yourself. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's why you stand out so much. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that makes you nervous? Because, and the reason I, let me tell you why I ask, right? Because I I see you do these impressive freestyles. Mm -hmm. 
And I've seen impressive people ask you to do impressive (laughs) freestyles. And I wonder, is she like about to pee her pants before she does this? Is is she, you know, is her stomach in knots? Is it thrilling? Like what makes you nervous? And does that make you nervous? Absolutely. You know, absolutely. (laughs) I am, I am coined the Aristotle of bravado. And because bravado does mean boldness and confidence, that is what I always want to exude because I think that every woman should walk into a room with her head high, regardless of her situation, regardless of what she feels like at the moment, because it is, I don't know, when you give that energy, people are able to feel it and people are able to not only feel it, but adopt it for themselves. And you give that to other people, the need and the, the feeling to feel confident. But heck yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I what, I think my most nervous freestyle Ooh. I've ever done was Sway. I had to do, so I don't know if you know the rules of Sway. When you go in, no. you do not get to pick your beat. They give you a beat there. That is what it is. <laughs> like on the spot, you pick a beat. And whenever he tells you to keep going, you keep going, regardless of whether you feel like you don't have nothing left to do. So when I walked in, I had sway early morning. I think I had to be there like eight o'clock in the morning. It was in the city. Um, My mom had drove me down. I was in the passenger seat. Like, I'm not going in. She said, what are you talking about? Why are you not going in? I was like, my stomach hurts so bad. And I made her put on Yolanda Adams. I was like singing gospel. And Mm. when I walked in... The co-host, Heather B., I love her so much. She literally grabbed my hand and was like, what's wrong with you? I was, she, I was like, I'm just nervous. She said, give the devil back his emotions. And she prayed all over wow. me. Wow. Yep. She, what? Yes, girl. Girl. She prayed over me. And when he said, drop that beat, I just did what I had to do. But another coping mechanism of mine is I always wear, if you notice, I always wear sunglasses in my freestyles because I feel like people mm-hmm. can't see me. Like, I feel like I'm, like, invisible. Like, like mm. people can't see me. So it's just one of my other little little coping mechanisms for nervousness or whatever. Yeah. What is so... You've talked about this, you know, you going on Sway. And it's a moment that I think anybody that knows and loves you saw and was very just awestruck by. But what did that moment teach you? That what is for you is forever for you, I think. I think I had practiced so much. I had put in so many hours behind the scenes rapping. and I had been prepping for Sway for maybe two months. Just whatever he was going to throw at me. I, had, I used to have my friends throwing random beats. Like, and I'm going to see if I can catch the pocket in this. I can, I'm going to see if I can. I've been training. I've been training, training, training. And still at that moment, I was like, I can't do it. And so just, I guess, the affirmation and just knowing that, like, whatever is for you will always be for you. It's predestined like that. And so, yes, in addition to the prayer feeling overwhelming and and a release of all nervousness and anxiety, it also was a, you know, reconfirmation that I'm always going to perform at the highest level as long as I prepare to. Oh, that's good. You know what else that's making me think about? Whenever I, I'm tip, I'm not like a person that's typically nervous, uh-huh. but I have found just by doing self-analysis scans yeah. that when I am nervous... It comes from a lack of me feeling prepared. Preparedness is is how it works. Literally, it's so funny because anytime somebody wishes me good luck, I'm always like, luck is often with the person who doesn't include it in his plans and happens when preparedness meets opportunity. So when you are prepared for something, you're always going to have the luck already. You're already going to, you already got it. Wow. When you're prepared for something, you already have the luck. Yeah. How have you felt like you've, how do you feel you've been received in hip hop? Do you feel like you've had support? Is the industry as ugly as people say it is? I need the insider tea on what's going on over there. (laughs) It's uglier than people say it is. It's a hundred times uglier. People's spirits are disgusting. Their auras are disgusting. And yeah, I honestly... It's a daily question for me. I can't even definitively be like, oh, yeah, like, (laughs) I don't have these doubts. Every single day, I'm like, I don't know if I could do this. It's a little too dark for me. The way my spirit is, the way I am in tune with my God, it's very, it's it's a little bit much for me. But I do believe in getting what you can from it without letting it become you and, and going on about the next venture of your life. So I don't expect to be in music forever. You know, it's just, it's too all consuming. It's just too all-consuming. People are weird and shady. And yes, I've experienced a lot of support and I've had a lot of people 
really support me. But also, it's been a lot of things that people could have done more. And they just kind of stand by and wait for it to kind of happen on its own, which is which is totally fine. It's just, I know when, for me, if I have a resource and it takes nothing for me to share it, I, don't, I always make sure it's, it's being shared. You know, I believe in lifting as I climb, but it's not, I, I can't mm-hmm. expect everyone to be like me, you know? So in that space, just kind of like paying attention to how people move when you have nothing that can instantly benefit them is important for me. Yeah. Dang, it's darker than I even thought it was. But sure. you're right. I too see you as a light. And that has to be tough. So like, how do you stay lifted? How do you stay illuminated Mm -hmm. in an industry that wants to make you dark? I surround myself with people who don't need anything from me. You know, my closest Mm -hmm. friends, my core, my group. I love them so much because if I decide that one day I don't want to do this anymore, it does not affect our friendship. It does not affect what they do day to day. What Literally, what I do does not have any bearings on them. We don't have a contingency plan with one another. They will still show up and show out whether I'm broke, uh, poor, rich, famous, whatever. That is my group. That's who prays with me, prays over me, catches me when I fall. And so I think having that small but very critical circle is so important. I'm not sure what I would be without my support group. And I don't even mean my industry team. I mean, like, my real friends. Like, I don't have industry friends. Like, I don't. Mm. They're cool. Like everyone's an associate. Ask that. Yeah, yeah. Associate Lee, like you guys are all cool. I, I like you guys. Y'all are cool. Hi, hi. How are you? We can bump shoulders at places, but as far as like praying with me, praying in my space, I don't mm. know what type of relationship you have with God. I don't know what where your prayers go. I, you know, like to be mm. within my space and my family and people that I know are for me. I don't want to win and look beside me and go. These are not the people that are supposed to be here when I won. Wow. You know. So, wow, 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 wow. You're talking about your destiny advocates, people who you are surrounded by that can remind you of your destiny and lift you up at times when you are unable to do so for yourself. Mm -hmm. I talk about that a lot. It is the difference. Yeah. Period. It's the difference. Do you have any community, would you say, within the entertainment Industry, the music industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's communities. It's just boundaries within everything. You know, I'm, I'm really big mm. on setting boundaries. And this is just something that I've come to realize this year, between this year and last year, I used to have a big problem setting boundaries within spaces. Like sometimes I'd overlap them and tell people they could come here and they could do this and they could do that. It's not good. It's not conducive to mix those type of circles because I also have a really bad poker face nowadays. And mm. I can't even fake it, girl. I'd be like, mm. Don't really care for you. Yeah. <laughs> who's who's someone or an experience in the music industry that's like really touched you? I love the story mm-hmm. about Heather over at Sway. And I just think yeah. that's such a beautiful moment. I but has it. there been an, another moment in your career where you were just like, wow, that I needed that. That lifted yeah. me up. That felt good. Yeah. So Clark Kent, DJ Clark Kent is one of my mentors He's like a fairy godfather. (laughs) That's what I I like to Mm. call him. He is extremely pivotal in my career and uplifting in every way. Every time I wanted to quit, every time, I mean, he would call me and just go, I don't understand. Like, what do you think the game is without you? Why do you think that you should quit? You know what I mean? We would would have these profound talks and I just go, I don't think that they understand what I'm trying to do. They don't, no one understands me. No one gets me. No one wants to invest in it. No one gets it. And he's like, no one got anybody. You know, he's the one who brought out Jay-Z. So just, he's like, I see the same thing that I saw in him, in you. And like, just having that and keeping that spirit. And, you know, we always end up with a prayer, like at the end, or like some acknowledgement of God. And I always say like, God is good. And he goes, lady, cheeseburgers are good. God is great. (laughs) You know, like, that's Mm -hmm. like his thing. Like he, he really is probably one of the only reasons that I can say that I got through some of my darkest moments in the industry. Yeah. That's a blessing. I I was over here, like, gagging when you said, (laughs) I don't see myself doing this forever. (laughs) And I think that that is, the reason why I was over here gagging is because I think that's such a gift that you've given yourself, and here's why. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be an actor my whole life. Mm -hmm. I always saw it as the only thing for me, forever. Mm -hmm. I would be Cicely Tyson- you know, till I'm in my 90s. I love that. 
on a stage in front of a camera. And I'm at a point in my life now where it's almost like God was like, okay, I'm gonna let you have that. I'm gonna let you keep thinking that that is what you're just gonna do for the rest of your life. But he's, I'm in a season in my life where he's reminding me mm-hmm. of all the other things that have been destined for me right. and all the other gifts he's given me and all the other exciting plans that he has ahead for me that might not be related to acting. I had to be, you know, God really kind of had to <laughs> work on you. sit me down. Yeah, he had to sit <laughs> me down, have a really tough talk, you know, with me. It was a little different, but I love that you gave that to yourself. Yeah. You've already said, I can just be myself and go hard And no matter what happens, really, it's okay. Because this isn't the end-all, be-all for me. And I just think that's, when did you have that epiphany? Yeah, I mean, I I don't know if it was much of an epiphany as much as it was just paying attention to the algorithm, right? The shelf life of rap music is not long anymore. Mm. You know, people have the attention spans of tomatoes, what we used to consume, five-minute records back in 1999. We can't even do a full three-minute record now. No one is sitting down for a three-minute record. No one is sitting down for a three-verse record. So when you're looking at things and the average song is two minutes and nine seconds, and it's a hit until it's not, and it's easily forgotten as fast as it's consumed, you got to realize that you have to, the type of oversaturation in the market that you have to put in in order to be consistently relevant all the time and to talk of discussion all the time, it's a shelf life to it. It's like, how many times do you buy milk in a month? Exactly. It keeps expiring. It keeps expiring. It keeps mm. expiring. It's it's important that you use it as your foundation to get in the game, to set the precedent of what you came here to do, what your, re- your real passion is. My real passion is music. I love it. It comes easy to me. It's a talent and a skill set and a gift. And I embrace it as such. But beyond that is branding. Beyond that is figuring out what else do I have passions about? How can I add on to that? How can I become this full being, this full person? And maybe Mm -hmm. that's in different branches of things. Getting pigeonholed and held up means that you're setting an expectation and setting yourself up for the disappointment in a field instead of being like, well, I'm kind of, I'm a planner. I'm going to figure out what's the next thing to do. And I'm always going to be consistent at whatever I do, be the greatest at whatever I do. And then that's that. But we have to live. We only have one life. Imagine stress kills. You can't keep going back to things that are bringing you down or continuously evolving. If you even look at Wayne, Wayne came in at the craziest time in rap. He changed between the, 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 the difference between analog and digital. You mean rapper Lil Wayne? Yep. And he a- adapted and made a whole different sound. Wayne started mm. the new rap age and he kept up for as long as he could and then groomed his two protégés to continue his legacy on. But he wow. understood. He understood the mission. So I want to know, what are the other branches yeah, that you um, want to explore in your life? Everything. It's so funny. I mean, not everything, <laughs> but obviously I want to get more into philanthropy, more into fashion, more into, um, you know, makeup brands and things like that. But I really want to get into um, deeper into healthcare because it is one of my pillars. It always has been. You know, I definitely want to figure out what I can do for our alma mater. I, you know, I wrote my commencement speech for when they give me my doctorate honorary right after I yes. got it. So they need to yes. figure it out. <laughs> they yes, need to Howard. We want, out. Some, we want some honorary degrees. We want all sorts I'm of things. Saying. Yes, Howard, if you're listening, we're ready. <laughs> yes, we're ready. So that is the type of things, a short term, that I really want to um, want to dive more into is just some type of giving back to communities, figuring out how I can loop that in with healthcare and underserved communities specifically. I love that. Before we go, mm-hmm. I want to know what has been your takeaway from this conversation? I mean, my biggest takeaway is just, you know, self-identity as we discussed, dealing with mental health, figuring out ways to get through it. Amongst just being a woman in this game and a woman in any industry there is, you know what I mean? Just kind of getting through it and learning your learning your strengths and your weaknesses, identifying them and being able to navigate through them. My takeaway from our conversation is I want to be a better scholar. Mm-hmm. I think that I've always been a pretty good scholar and things that I wanted to do and that I want to do, I pursue with vigor and I study. I always study my craft, but especially as I'm in a new world with my podcast, I 
want to dig even deeper. Yeah. I got to put in even more hours. You are inspiring me to be a bigger thinker and a better scholar. And Mm -hmm. that is a gift. That is really, really, anybody in your life that can make you think and dream and be Mm -hmm. bigger Mm -hmm. is a blessing. So I'm so honored to be in your presence. I think you were just absolutely fabulous. I am so excited for where you're heading. London, you were on the precipice of so much, and I cannot wait to be there cheering you on when you were there. I'm so inspired by your tenacity and also just your heart. You're a fantastic woman. So thank you for saying yes. Thank you. I know I know this is, you don't like interviews and conversations, <laughs> but thank you for saying yes to me. We did it. We did it. We did it. Thank you so much. <laughs> After the credits, Lady London takes us back to the late 90s for a headline tour with some of the greatest female MCs. Thank you for listening. This podcast is produced by LWC Studios for OWN. The show's executive producer is Juleka Lentigua. Its senior editor is Verilyn Williams. Sound designer is Cedric Wilson. Managing producers are Camille Stennis and Paulina Velasco. Assistant producers are Lauren Francis and Michelle Baker. If you enjoyed listening to this episode, and we hope you do, please make sure to subscribe, leave a rating, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to ensure you hear the next one. All right, if you could go back in time and insert yourself in a moment of hip-hop history, what would it be? (laughs) I could think of two times at the top of my head. One time would probably be for ladies' night for sure, some type of like female collaboration, like of the greats together, for sure. Like a Latifah mm-hmm. moment, Moni Love, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like MC Light, like a moment like that. But I think more specifically, I would have loved to have been in the Foxy Brown and Kim era around the time mm-hmm. when they were both on an emerging space. And I would have loved to be able to pioneer a tour with all of us. Um, like an all-female wow. hip-hop tour. I think that would have been incredible and an in- entire sh- culture shock for the community, especially in 99, 2000. That would be where I wanted to be in a sense of wow. female greatness in hip-hop at its core. That's amazing. Yeah, I would, I would be there. Front row and center. <laughs> I would definitely be there. <laughs> <laughs>